Hello everyone, I'm Paris Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox, hosted by Richard Lummis. What makes a great leader? Is it genetic or can you learn leadership skills? Join Tom Fox and Richard Lummis in this podcast, where they consider leadership from a wide variety of perspectives, academic, behavioral science, history, popular culture, the movies, and much more. You'll learn about specific tactics and strategies that you can bring to your own leadership toolkit. 12 O'Clock High is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode, based on Plutarch's Lives, we discuss the Greek Epimondus and the Roman, Roman Scipio Africanus. I know you will enjoy this episode. 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership, is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, this is Richard Lummis, and I'm here with Tom Fox for another episode. Hello, this is Richard Lummis, and I'm here with Tom Fox for another episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast about leadership. In these discussions, we draw what we hope are interesting examples from our own experiences, history, business, literature, and politics to examine what constitutes good leadership and extract lessons we can use to improve our own leadership skills. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Richard. Today, we're going to continue our series based on Plutarch's lives of the noble Grecians and Romans. Today's subjects are Epimenondas, I'm probably butchering that, and Scipio Africanus. Text of Plutarch for these two is actually lost. We're a bit on our own here, but we do know that he... uh, he thought that these two people were comparable. As before, it should be noted that Plutarch was a Greek writing at the time of the Julio-Claudian emperors. And although some of the forms of the Roman Republic survived, not much of the spirit did. Plutarch's attempts to draw character lessons depends in part on the differences of the times, and he tends to contrast the virtues of the past eras with the decadence of the current times. Tom, what, uh, what can you tell us about Epaminondas? So Epaminondas uh, was a Greek general, and I must confess I was not aware of him as a historical figure, although in researching for this podcast, I determined that he is certainly worthy of study. 418 BC to uh, 362 BC, he was a Theban of the 4th century who transformed the ancient Greek city-state of Thebes, leading it out of Spartan subjugation and into the preeminent position in Greek politics, which was called the Theban homogeny. In the process, he broke Spartan military power that we'll go into in some detail with his victory at Lucretia or Lutra and liberated uh, the Mycenaean Helots, a group of Peloponnesian Greeks who'd been enslaved under Spartan rule for some 230 years after being defeated in the Mycenaean War, ending in 600 BC. He reshaped the political map of Greece, fragmented old alliances, created new ones, supervised the construction of entire cities, he is also militarily influential and invented several uh, and implemented several major battlefield tactics. Xenophon describes his ad- admiration for him in his major work, Hellenissa. In later centuries, the Roman orator Cicero called him the first man of Greece. And even in modern times, Ontangia, the Frenchman, judged him as one of the three worthiest and most excellent men that had lived. The changes he wrought on the Greek political order did not long outlive him as the cycle of shifting homogenies and alliances continued unabated. A mere 27 years after his death, a recalcitrant Thebes was obliterated by Alexander the Great. Thus, Epimondas, who had been praised in his time as an idealist and a liberator, is today largely remembered for one decade of campaigning that sapped the strength of the great city-states and paved the way for the Macedonian conquest, another facet I had not fully appreciated. In matters of character, Epaminondas was above reproach in the eyes of ancient historians who recorded his deeds. Nepos notes his incorruptibility, describing his rejection of a Persian ambassador who came to him with a bribe. These aspects of his character greatly uh, contributed to his renown after his death. He was described as one of the most talented generals ever produced by a Greek Mm city-state. Even Xenophon said of his Matean campaign, now for my part, I could not say that his campaign proved fortunate, yet of all possible deeds of forethought and daring, the man seems to have left not one undone. 
Indeed, as a tactician, he stands above every other Greek general in history except the kings, Philip II, and Alexander II, although modern historians have questioned his larger strategic vision. His tactics did mark the beginning of the end of the traditional Greek method of warfare. His innovative strategy at Lucretia or Leuctra allowed him to defeat the vaunted Spartan phalanx with a smaller force. No mean feat indeed. Many of his tactical innovations um, would be used by Philip of Macedon, who spent it the youth as a hostage in Thebes and may have learned directly from Epaminondas himself. In some ways, as I said, he dramatically altered uh, the face of Greece during the 10 years he was its central figure. By the time of his death, Sparta had been humbled, Messina free, and the Peloponnese completely reorganized. In another respect, however, he left behind a Greece no different than the way he found it, the bitter divides and animosity that poisoned international relations for Greece and every for over a century, rather, remain deep or at, deeper or as deep as they had been before. The brutal internecine, uh, internecine warfare that had characterized the years from 432 onwards continued unabated until all states involved had been subjugated by uh, the uh, Macedonians. He's therefore remembered as a liberator and a destroyer. He was celebrated throughout Greek and Roman worlds as one of the greatest men of history, Cicero eulogized him as the first man, in my judgment, of Greece. For all his noble qualities, unfortunately, he was unable to transcend the Greek city-state system with its endemic rivalry and warfare, therefore left Greek a more war-ravaged, but no less divided uh, geography than before he found, or than when he found it. Uh, Hornblower asserts that is the sign of his political failure even before the Battle of Matinae, uh, that his Peloponnese allies fought to reject Sparta rather than because of the positive attractions of Thebes. Cockwell, however, concludes that Epaminondas must be judged not in the relation to these inevitable limitations of Boeotian power to have established the power of Boeotia and ended the Spartan domination of the Peloponnese was the most and best that a Boeotian could have done. So uh, a lot really there, Richard, on the tactical side, I must say, as I, as I indicated when we started, I really was not aware of uh, Epaminondas at all. So I was very interested in his tactical innovations. The other thing that struck me was Sparta uh, ruled basically from the end of the Peloponnesian War to from 404 BC to 431 BC. So they had a pretty long run where they were the, the big dog. And uh, for the over the next 10 years or so, Epaminondas uh, was able to defeat the Spartans and really limit their power and indeed break them for um, of their leadership uh, as well as uh, their political hold. But uh, it must be noted that this did open up uh, the country of Greece or the rather the perhaps the city states of Greece for invasion and conquest by Philip of Macedon and his son, Alexander the Great. So uh, a lot to uh, to talk about there, but uh, one of my favorite characters in all of Roman history is Scipio Africanus. So what do you have about him? Well, I had at least heard of him, which I had not heard of Epaminondas. Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus is best known as the general who won the Second Punic War for Rome, uh, defeating Hannibal. He's often regarded as one of the best commanders and strategists of all time. He lived from about 236 to 183 BC, um, and he was born into one of the Cornelii, who were one of the six major patrician families in Rome, having been eminent since the days of the early Republic. His father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all served as consuls. His early military career was not terribly auspicious, but he did survive the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC, uh, one of the most famous uh, battles of all time, but uh, not very good for the Romans. I'd forgotten this, but at the, at Iberia at the time had been settled by and was under the control of the Carthaginians. In uh, 211 BC, Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal Barca, defeated the Romans at the Battle of Upper Baetis in Spain, killing both Scipio's father and his uncle. 
When the Romans decided to send another army, Scipio was the only man willing to serve as proconsul, so he was elected despite being only 25. Everybody else seems to have regarded the job as a death sentence. Um, Carthaginians were hampered by having three generals, Hasdrubal and Mago Barca, brothers of Hannibal, and a, a guy named Hasdrubal Gisco. Somehow, Scipio managed to surprise them, and he landed at the mouth of the Ebro River and seized the city of New Carthage, capturing a lot of military supplies and an excellent harbor. But here he began to really show some of his brilliance because he treated the prisoners and hostages well, and in fact, when offered a beautiful woman as a prize of war, he instead returned her to her fiancé, a local Celtic Iberian chieftain, together with the money he'd offered to ransom her. And at this point, many of the local chieftains began to view the Romans as liberators rather than conquerors and began to aid Scipio. In 209 BC, he defeated Hasdrubal Bark at the Battle of Baecula when he was able to use his cavalry to perform a double envelopment of Hasdrubal's army. Um, although routed, Hasdrubal was able to regroup and retreat and eventually cross the Alps into Italy. Scipio was criticized for his failure to follow up the, the victory with the destruction of Hasdrubal's army but it was probably out of wariness of being trapped by the other two Carthaginian armies in the area. Uh, with his local allies, he finally achieved a decisive victory at Ilipa in 206 BC, which resulted in the Carthaginians abandoning Spain. Scipio then visited two Numidian princes in Africa who supplied Carthage with cavalry and troops and received their support, although one of them named Syphax later reneged and married a Carthaginian noblewoman and continued to fight for them. On his return to Spain, he had to quell a mutiny among the troops, but the, he then gave up his command and returned to Rome. The following year, he was unanimously elected consul, and he argued for an invasion of Africa, but was only granted the troops garrisoning Sicily because of envy and the opposition of people such as Fabius, who regarded it as a dangerous distraction from Hannibal roaming around Italy. Troops in Italy were generally regarded as subpar and included those who had been defeated at Cannae, uh, Scipio also raised a volunteer force of 30 warships and 7,000 men, turned Sicily into a training camp for the infantry, but he also developed a nucleus of Roman cavalry to combat the Numidian cavalry. Senate sent a commission of inquiry to Sicily, uh, probably based on political enemies of Scipio's, but they found that Scipio had formed a well-trained and disciplined army. I still refused to provide any financial or military support for his proposed invasion. Despite this, he invaded Africa in 204 BC, and in 203, he destroyed the combined Numidian and Carthaginian army by the stratagem of approaching stealthily and setting fire to their camp, causing panic. He was then able to kill or capture some 40,000 troops. It's been condemned by some historians as a cowardly way to uh, conduct a battle, although it's not clear to me exactly why. The ultimate effect was to deprive the Carthaginians of the services of the Numidian cavalry for the remainder of the war and bring them over to the Roman side. Scipio offered moderate terms of surrender to Carthage, but they opted instead to recall Hannibal from Italy with about 40,000 men and 80 elephants. They met at Zama in 202 BC, one of the most famous battles of antiquity. Hannibal's approach was straightforward. He would use his war elephants to create gaps in the Roman lines, and then a frontal assault would take advantage of them. Scipio, however, instead of traditional lines parallel to the enemy formation, set up his troop in perpendicular lines guarded by elephant traps and trumpeters to confuse the elephants, rendering them uh, pretty much a, a non-factor in the resulting battle. The battle was fierce. It was ultimately decided when the Numidian and Roman cavalry drove the Carthaginian cavalry from the field and returned to attack the Carthaginian infantry from the rear. Scipio defied the Senate by dictating moderate terms, which included surrender of the Carthaginian fleet and tribute payments, and he also allowed Hannibal to become the civic leader of Carthage. He returned to Rome in triumph, but refused many honors, such as consul for life and dictator. In 199 BC, he was elected censor and lived quietly out of politics for several years. But in 190, he went to Syria with his brother Lucius and defeated Antiochus III of Syria. His political enemies, led by Cato the Elder, prosecuted Lucius for misappropriation of funds. When Lucius produced his account books at the Senate trial, Publius grabbed them and tore them to pieces and threw them on the floor, 
asking why they were so concerned about spending 3,000 talents while not questioning the 15,000 talents in tribute being paid by Antiochus. Prosecution was ashamed and dropped the case, although Lucius was later pro prosecuted and convicted following his brother's death. There were further efforts to prosecute Publius, but they were blocked by his public support and allies in the Senate, including Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, who subsequently married uh, Scipio's daughter, who is several decades his junior. Scipio retired to the country until his death in 183 BC at the age of 53 under suspicious circumstances. He may have committed suicide. Um, nobody really seems to know. He supposedly demanded that he be buried away from the ungrateful city of Rome. And no one knows where his tomb actually is now. His influence on Rome was profound. The conquest of Iberia created the first Roman territory outside of the Italian peninsula and can be regarded as the beginning of the exponential territorial expansion that would bring wealth and power to Rome. He was a Grecophile, and his admiration for Greek philosophy and culture were widely imitated in Rome. So Tom, I think we have two great generals here, um, neither one of whom um, was terribly successful at politics. But uh, what other comparisons do you think we can draw? We'll be back after a short break. Perhaps the non-success of both of these two in the political sphere, we can draw some lessons from this. In the ancient world, perhaps up until the middle of the 20th century, or, or perhaps up until the age of Napoleon, uh, the, the true great leaders were able to combine a military success and a political success as well. Uh, that roles, those types of roles have now been, been, been split perhaps starting in the American Civil War, but perhaps even earlier when the English uh, split those roles and was able to form a coalition to defeat Napoleon. But in the ancient world, they seem to be judged by uh, both spheres. In the military sphere, um, both were innovators, both were successful, both um, were able to change the basically the entire dynamic and conversation of the worlds they lived in at that point. Uh, Epimondas uh, broke 40 years basically of Spartan rule in not simply the Peloponnese, but also Bo Boeotia. And that probably alone uh, puts him in good stead with, with the most Greeks and uh, fans of Greek history. Scipio Africanus though, I was even more impressed when uh, I did my research for this um, Podcast. I was certainly aware of his defeat of Hannibal, but um, his, his his victories in Iberia, where he was able to couple a more nuanced political settlement by incorporating the Iberian princes as allies uh, of Rome, and they stayed allies of Rome uh, for probably a thousand years uh, after that, uh, yeah. maybe. Uh, Maybe, maybe that long, but nevertheless, uh, he created an alliance that uh, was very, very profitable to Rome. The, his military work uh, in defeating Hannibal, once again, though, showed a, a nuanced political settlement. And uh, we, we have not, and I don't think we'll do Cato the Elder here in this podcast series, but he is um, well known for ending every speech with, uh, Carthage must be destroyed, and that he firmly believed that it was the absolute destruction of Carthage. Only then would Rome rule supreme, and, and I would say he turned out to be correct in that. So uh, I, I saw a little more um, political nuance with Scipio, but that might not even be fair because in large part, Epimondus was able to keep a coalition together uh, for almost 10 years to defeat the Spartans and lead to this Theban homogeny, where Theban was certainly the first among equals, uh, if not the leader, not quite the Delian League of Athens, nevertheless, a very powerful league. Um, what did you see in those two realms? Well, I, I agree with you about Scipio's uh, political nuance. He was, he was fairly savvy, um, especially about dealing with foreigners. It was his dealings with the Senate that turned out to be sort of his downfall. Um, you're, you're absolutely correct that his uh, behavior towards the 
the local people of Spain uh, cemented, well, it took them a couple hundred years to finally consolidate and pacify the entire peninsula. But after that, they remained loyal to Rome um, until the Vandal invasion in the 5th century. Um, and it provided a great deal of, of wealth in the form of silver from the mines and, uh, and other raw materials, as well as grain, um, supporting Rome, I guess, until probably the imperial period when they uh, invaded Dalmatia um, and they got an, another set of silver mines. But um, anyway, it was, it was incredibly important for Rome's future development. Um, his overall strategic vision was also sound um, in that he's, he correctly realized he had to take the fight to Africa in order to get Hannibal out of Italy. Um, in that sense, I think he was... Uh, he was smarter than uh, his, his opponents in the Senate. And he managed to combine that with an excellent tactical sense and um, also very diligent preparation. And his work in forming the army in Sicily and insisting on training uh, really enabled him to fight Hannibal on Hannibal's veteran army on, on equal terms. Um, all in all, I think he was just a very impressive um, uh, person and uh, it's it's kind of interesting that his political influence inside Rome was so uh, limited. Richard, were you aware of, and if not, what were your thoughts after researching this for this podcast on the Theban homogeny? And was that truly a kind of a moment of of a shining star, or was it as later historians perhaps asserted that it was just? Uh, leading down the road for or opening up the Greek city-states to the Macedonian invasion? Well, I'm not sure either one's entirely fair. The um, It certainly amounted to a continuation of the internecine warfare that had characterized Greek politics ever since they defeated the Persians. So in that sense, he was not a transformative figure. The overthrow of the Spartan slave regime in, in the Peloponnesus, I think, you know, should certainly be regarded as a, a good thing. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that the, Mac the rise of Macedonia was not uh, basically foreordained by, um, by a number of factors, including Philip and Alexander's personal ambitions. And given the fragmented nature of the Greek city-states and that the Macedonians were not really um, savage barbarians like the Persians, uh, I'm not sure Greece would have united against them even in the absence of being exhausted by the, uh, by the constant warfare that uh, Epinon, Epiminondas uh, continued. Richard, one of the things that uh, both of these uh, leaders had was um, either a, sort of a personal code of honor or incorruptibility or uh, whatever you might choose to call it. And so the, the question I wanted to explore there was not really – whether they had it or not, because the, at least the commentators seem to believe it. But do you think Plutarch's and other historians' commentary around their incorruptibility is really speaking to a um, part of the times that Plutarch was writing that uh, the bribe was seen as a way to uh, get things, certainly the spoils of war were exactly that, and it was a time where uh, perhaps a moral code was not uh, used as much as it had been in earlier days? I think so. Um, I, th I think it was a way of commenting on the decadence of the current political system by Plutarch in a way that would not get him uh, killed or exiled uh, by referring to these people from what at that point was the distant past um, then the, it would not be seen as a direct criticism of the, uh, in particular, of the emperors. Um, so, yeah, I think, but I think we all have a tendency to paint the past as a golden era, and uh, it's not necessarily true. But certainly there were figures of, of great virtue um, that came up, and we'll see some more in our next podcast. Um, Scipio's incorruptibility I don't think was on a par with, with some of the other characters we'll see in uh, in Plutarch um, the um, 
the funds and the in the Syrian campaign certainly raised a lot of questions. What happened to all the money? But uh, but before that, and you know, he certainly seems to have been uh, not only honest, but uh, but regarded as so, uh, even by his opponents. I guess honorable rather than honest. But uh, but anyway, I think that, that that served him in good stead, and I think that's a good leadership lesson. Well, I certainly enjoy these two, Richard. I did too, and I'm learning a lot about uh, about some figures that uh, I knew vaguely of. Um, so I, I hope that our audience is finding this as interesting as we are. But for now, this is uh, Richard Lummis and Tom Fox with Twelve O'Clock High. We hope you'll tune in next time. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Twelve O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership. I hope you will join us again next week where we take up the Greek Pericles and the Roman Fabius Maximus in episode three of our series on Plutarch's Lives. This series on Plutarch's Lives on 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership, is a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network.